Tonight I want to talk to you about millions of years, its unscientific origin and catastrophic consequences. If you uh, look at a geology textbook or biology textbook or go to a museum, you'll see a display something like this, representing the geological history of the Earth from an evolutionary viewpoint. And the evolutionists say that from the very first living creature, uh, first single-celled creature up to the present, is uh, 3.5 billion years. Just an incomprehensible amount of time. How did that idea get so embedded into the minds of almost all people in the world today? Well, it developed about 200 years ago. And I want to look at that history and the consequences of that idea. What we need to understand is that the evolutionary theory is not just a theory about biology. It is a theory about the origin of the Earth, the origin of the solar system, the origin of the universe. This is a chart from Harvard University, one of their online courses, and it shows you uh, the, all the different aspects of the evolution view from the first Big Bang moment up to the present. It's all been evolution. And... Uh, so, a lot of people say, well, I don't agree with evolution, but they accept the millions of years, and they don't realize that biological evolution is just one part of it. You've got geological evolution to explain how the earth came into existence and how the rock layers and fossils and the topography of the earth formed over millions of years. And then you've got cosmological evolution to explain how stars and galaxies and planets and solar systems came into existence. And uh, <clears throat> most Christians today have accepted at least the millions of years, if not also evolution. I've had the privilege of speaking in 27 countries, and uh, it varies from country to country, but most Christians accept the millions of years. Most of our evangelical seminary professors and Christian college professors accept the millions of years. And they've tried to fit those millions of years or even evolution into the Bible. Nobody ever tries to put that time uh, after Adam, between Adam and us. They all always try to put it before Adam in uh, Genesis 1 somewhere. Some try to say that we can put it in if we just take the days of creation as figurative of long periods of time, hundreds of millions of years each. Uh, others say, well, no, the days are literal, but we can put the millions of years between each of the days. Uh, then another view that was more popular in the 19th and early 20th century, the gap theory. We can put all that geological history and the Big Bang and all of that stuff before verse 3 because they say that's when the six days begin, not in verse 1. And then there are some today who say that Genesis 1 does not teach us anything about uh, how or when God created. It's only telling us that God gave function to the creation. The creation was, was happened, uh, happened before verse 1, and the Bible actually doesn't tell us, they say, anything about God creating the world. So... I want to look at this idea that has become so prevalent, and before we do, I want to draw your attention to two passages of Scripture that are very relevant. The first is 2 Corinthians chapter 10. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses. We are destroying speculations and every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God, and we are taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. Paul said to the Christians in the first century, we're in a war. It's a war of ideas. He calls them speculations. In this translation, uh, the King James translates the same Greek word, imaginations. And these are high and lofty ideas, Paul says. They're raised up against the knowledge of God, which means that they're raised up against God's word. And Paul says as Christians, we need to take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ, which means to take every thought captive to the word of God. Then in Colossians chapter 2, Paul says, See to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deception, according to the tradition of men, according to the elementary principles of the world, rather than according to Christ. Christ. 
Paul says, be careful. There are ideas out there that are philosophies and traditions of men. They're the elementary principles that the world thinks about, but they're deceptive. And uh, you will be taken captive if you are not paying attention and discerning. Now, every one of us in this room can be deceived. If you're only so told certain information, you can be deceived. If you're not allowed to hear any contrary perspective, you can be deceived. And a person who thinks they can't be deceived is deceived already. Every one of us can be deceived. Well, what I want to uh, argue tonight is that much of the church has been deceived, has been taken captive by philosophy and empty tradition, by the speculations and imaginations of man, and it has been catastrophic in the results. Now, to understand this issue, we need to understand that there are two broad categories of science. I like to call them operation science and origin science. Operation science is uh, what we normally think of when we think of science. It uses the so-called scientific method, and it can be defined this way. The use of observable, repeatable experiments in a controlled environment, that's usually in a laboratory, to understand how things operate or function in the present physical universe, to find cures for disease, produce new technology, put a man on the moon, etc. So uh, operation science is uh, also sometimes called experimental science or observational science. And uh, most of biology, chemistry, physics, engineering research, medical research, these are examples of operation science. We're studying how things operate or function in the present so that we can manipulate those things to improve our lives. But that kind of science won't answer the question, how did the Grand Canyon form? Because you can't recreate the Grand Canyon in the laboratory. It's there, those rock layers and that huge hole in the ground with those erosional features are there. There are fossils and radioactive isotopes in those rocks. And the question is, what happened in the unobserved past to produce what we're looking at in the present? Now, we don't have any uh, any eyewitnesses of that, so we're trying to reconstruct the unobserved past. Operation science won't answer the question, how did those creatures come into existence? Now the question here is not, how do you get a dog from a previous dog? How do you get a squirrel from a previous squirrel? The question is, how did the first dog come into existence? How did the first elephant or squirrel come into existence? That's a historical question. You can't recreate that event in the laboratory. Uh, operation, experimental, uh, observational science won't answer the question, how did Saturn and its rings come into existence? That's a historical question. And so for historical questions, we need what I call origin science which uses the so-called uh, legal historical method, which can be defined this way. The use of reliable eyewitness testimony, if any is available, and observable evidence to determine the past unobservable, unrepeatable event or events which produce the observable evidence that we see in the present. So we're looking at the evidence in the present, whether it's rock layers and fossils, whether it's DNA, whether it's living creatures, uh, whether it's objects out in space, and we're looking at that observational evidence and we're trying to reconstruct the past to explain how those things came into existence or were formed or shaped over time. The only difference between creation and evolution, both of them are stories about the past. They're origin stories. They're both trying to reconstruct the past. The only difference between them is that creationists have an eyewitness testimony. The Creator was there, and He has described key events to interpret the world that we live in. The evolutionists deny that this book is from the Creator. But we're all looking at the same evidence in the present. So 
origin sciences would be uh, historical geology, paleontology, archaeology, cosmology. Criminal investigation is a form of origin science. You're looking at the evidence in the present, trying to figure out what happened in the unobservable, unrepeatable past to produce the evidence you see in the present. So, evolutionists, most evolutionists deny this significant distinction between operation science and origin science, and they will convince people that their stories about the past are true because they have successfully produced aspirin or cell, plants, cell phones or space shuttles and say, see, science did this, science is telling us the truth about origins. Ernst Mayer is one of the few evolutionists who does recognize this significant difference. Evolution is a historical process that cannot be proven by the same arguments and methods by which purely physical or functional phenomena can be documented. Dr. Mayer died at the age of 100 a few years ago. He was professor of zoology at Harvard University, an ardent evolutionist and an atheist until his death. But he recognizes that there is a significant difference between those kinds of science. Now, the first 1,800 years of uh, church history, virtually the universal belief of the church was that God created in six days a few thousand years ago and destroyed the world with a global flood at the time of Noah. That view was rapidly rejected about 200 years ago as the idea of millions of years was born. And so we want to look at that history. There wasn't just one person that developed this idea. There were a number of people uh, over about a 50 or 60 year period. And uh, I only have time to mention a few, three of the most influential. One of them was James Hutton. He studied medicine at the university in, in Scotland where he lived. Uh, he took over the family farm after he graduated, but his real love was rocks. And in 1788, he wrote a journal article. Then seven years later, he wrote a whole book, Theory of the Earth. And as he uh, looked at his farmland, he could see evidence of wind and water erosion. Uh, and uh, the, the water would carry those little particles of sediment to creeks, which would carry them to the rivers. And the rivers would uh, dump those sediments on the ocean floor. And then he could see evidence of volcanic activity in Scotland. And he imagined that the internal heat of the, of the earth would harden those sediments on the ocean floor and then through some convulsion cause some of those sediments to come above sea level and become new land masses. And so he said the continents are slowly being eroded into the oceans. The ocean's floors are being lifted up to become new continents which will eventually be eroded into the oceans, which will eventually be lifted up to become new continents. And so he said, I can see no evidence of a beginning in the rock record. Now he never saw a single continent get eroded into the ocean. He never saw a single continent come out of the ocean. He was speculating or imagining about the unobserved past to explain the continents and the topography that he sees in the present. Then there was uh, George Cuvier. He was a French scientist, a comparative anatomist and paleontologist. And he studied the fossils that were found in and around Paris. And he came up with a different theory of the earth, which he published in 1812 based on other writings uh, that he, uh, in journal articles. And as he looked at those fossils, he came up with the idea that they were the result of a series of catastrophic floods of a continental or global scale, each flood separated by a long period of time. And uh, he was clearly thinking of millions of years. He never saw a single one of those continental or global floods. He didn't see those fossils form. He was speculating and imagining about the unobserved past to explain the fossils that he found in the rock layers in and around Paris. And then finally, there was uh, Charles Lyell. He was born the year that James Hutton died, and he built on Hutton's ideas. 
And he studied law at Oxford University. There were no university degrees in geology at this time. There were no paid geologists at this time. It was wealthy, the wealthy man's uh, avocation to go out and tromps around the world, or really just around Europe, looking at rock layers and fossils. But in 1830, he published his first of his three volumes of Principles of Geology, in which he argued there have never been any catastrophic floods of a continental or global scale. The processes of geological change have always been the same on average per year in terms of their intensity, frequency, and power. It's basically slow, gradual erosion, slow, gradual sedimentation. Oh, an earthquake here, a volcano there every so often, but nothing any greater or more powerful than we observe today on average per year. It's just slow, gradual change. And so that expanded Earth history uh, even more. So in the, in the early 19th century, we had three competing views of Earth history. We had the uh, catastrophist view of uh, Smith, or, excuse me, Cuvier and others. Uh, of a, uh, they, they certainly believed in God, so they believed in a supernatural beginning that God created the first forms of life. They did not believe in evolution, and there were evolutionary ideas uh, circulating at this time. Uh, 50 years before Darwin. Um, but on their timeline, they had these seas, these major catastrophic floods that uh, buried uh, a lot of creatures that became fossils, and then the earth recovered from every one of those uh, events, either by God supernaturally creating new creatures or survivors repopulating the earth. Then there was the uh, uniformitarian view of Lyle and Hutton and others. From their writings, we can't be sure if they believed in a supernatural beginning. They might have been secret atheists. Uh, in those days in Britain, uh, it wasn't socially acceptable to be an atheist. So people would often hide their real views with a little bit of God language thrown in to keep their religious readers happy. But on their timeline, uh, there were no seas. No catastrophic floods of a continental or global scale, just slow, gradual processes of change. And then in contrast to that was the uh, view of the, uh, a group of authors that I studied for my PhD research called the Scriptural Geologists. And uh, <clears throat> they believed the Bible, so they believed in a supernatural creation week of six literal days, followed about 1,600 years later by Noah's flood, which they argued was responsible for producing most of the geological record of rock layers and fossils. And then the earth recovered from that event up to the present, and this whole period of history was about 6,000 years. So three different views of earth history. Most Christians quickly accepted those ideas, however, and so they reinterpreted Genesis to accommodate the millions of years. One uh, influential man was Thomas Chalmers. Chalmers was a Presbyterian minister up in Scotland. And in 1804, as a young pastor of just 24 years old, he began to preach what became known as the gap theory. He said, the Bible doesn't tell us how old the earth is. So it says how old man is, about 6,000 years, but it doesn't say how old the earth is. So we can take all the time the geologists want to talk about and put it before verse 3 in Genesis 1. He never gave a careful, never even attempted a careful biblical discussion to argue for this. He just asserted it, and he was a very gifted orator and influenced a lot of people to, in the church to hold that view. Then there was George Stanley Faber. He was an Anglican theologian, uh, well-respected, and in 1823 he published a book in which he argued for what became known as the day-age view, that the days of Genesis are not literal days, they're figurative of long periods of time. Now those are reinterpretations of Genesis 1, but if you're going to fit millions of years into the Bible, you've got to do something with Noah's flood. And so one approach was that of John Fleming. In 1826, he wrote a journal article in which he argued that uh, 
Noah's flood was a global peaceful flood. It was so peaceful, it left no geological evidence. And uh, he said the proof is right there in the biblical text. When Noah sent out a dove from the ark, it came back with an olive leaf in its beak. And that shows that the flood was so peaceful, it didn't even damage the plants. I don't know anybody that holds that view today because that is an oxymoron. Uh, talking about floods that leave no evidence is like talking about square circles. So a more popular view was that of John Pye Smith, a uh, congregational theologian. And in 1838, he published a book in which he argued that Noah's flood was a local flood in the Middle East, in the Mesopotamian Valley, and just described in exaggerated language. Now, those men were all, uh, we would call them conservative Christians. They all would affirm that the Bible is the inspired, infallible Word of God. But there was one other approach at this time, and that was the, um, if I can get that to work, the liberal theologians. Liberal theology had been developing on the European continent from the middle of the 18th century, but it had largely been kept out of Britain and North America because of the great evangelical awakenings under the Wesley brothers and Whitfield in England, Whitfield and Jonathan Edwards and others here in the United States. But in the 1810s, uh, liberal theology started to seep into the churches of Britain and North America, and the liberal theologians said, you other people are all wrong because you're treating Genesis as history. Genesis 1 to 11 is mythology. Just like the ancient Jews, uh, excuse me, the ancient Egyptians and Babylonians and Assyrians, they had creation and flood myths, so did the ancient Jews. These are pre scientific, primitive, superstitious stories. So in the early 1800s, we had these various compromised views with old earth geology. Uh, the gap theory, the, the uh, it's hard to read them backwards on that glass back there. Uh, the day-age view, the global peaceful flood, local flood, and Genesis' myth. And in the midst of all of that were those men that I studied, the scriptural geologists. And I discovered about 30 authors in Great Britain where I was focusing because this was where the most intense uh, debate was going on. 30 authors writing anywhere from 30-page uh, pamphlets to two-volume, 700-page books. And they were raising biblical, philosophical, and geological arguments against these old earth ideas and various uh, Christian compromise views. And if you want to read more about that, this is a shortened version of my PhD thesis. And unlike many scholars, my writing is pretty easy to understand. So if you're interested in the history, uh, you can dig into that. But what I showed in, uh, in the thesis, what I argued in the, in the book, is that contrary to what most historians of geology uh, have said about this period, this was not a battle between the geologists who knew the rocks and a bunch of Bible-thumping pastors or theologians who didn't know anything about the rocks. Um, Actually, it was a, a battle of a religious and philosophical nature. It was a worldview conflict. A conflict between the religious and philosophical ideas or assumptions of one group of scientists and non-scientists against the religious and philosophical assumptions of another group of scientists and non-scientists, both looking at the same geological evidence. So, we need to understand this worldview conflict just a little bit. Deism. How many of you have ever heard of deism? Deism was a religious view that was popular in the late 17th and early 18th century. Uh, Deists said there is a God who created the world, but he created the world in a rather simple form. He built into the creation the laws of nature, and then he let it develop according to those laws. So kind of like a watchmaker who makes the watch, winds it up, and lets it run the way he's designed it. So in a deist view, God is distant. He's in the past. He doesn't interfere in his creation. Therefore, there are no miracles. There's no inspired scripture. There's no 
answered a prayer. It was a religion of, of good works based on nature. And uh, it received a very firm response from Christian apologists at the time. So that by about the middle of the 18th century, uh, it had kind of disappeared as a visible religious movement. But the ideas didn't disappear. And uh, they found their way into liberal theology and back into science in the 19th century. Then there was atheism. Now, in the history of mankind, the vast majority of people have believed in some kind of God or gods. But atheism really began to take hold in Europe, uh, particularly in France, where it led to the bloody French Revolution. And of course, the atheist says the universe is all there is. There is no God. Contrast that with biblical Christianity. Like deism, the Bible teaches that there is a God who is uh, outside the creation, above, beyond. He is transcendent. But the Bible says one other important thing about God related to our topic, and that is that God is imminent in his creation. He is upholding his creation by the word of his power. And from time to time, he operates or acts in his creation in a way that the Bible calls miracle or a providential intervention. And uh, so three different views of God and God's relationship to the world. Scientists, uh, historians of science have a pretty good idea uh, about the theology of those men who developed the old earth thinking. And I'm only mentioning the three that I've already mentioned, but others who contributed to this idea had the same theology. Uh, Hutton was a deist or an atheist. Uh, historians aren't sure. Cuvier was a deist or a vague theist. He certainly believed in God, but he wasn't a Bible-believing Christian. And Lyle was a deist or a Unitarian which for this subject doesn't make any difference. So I want you to notice something. These men are not unbiased, objective pursuers of truth. They didn't just go out and look at the rocks and the fossils and say, well, we'll just let the facts speak for themselves. Because rocks and fossils don't speak for themselves. They have to be interpreted. And these men were consciously anti-Christian in Christian Europe. They were consciously anti-Bible. And some of them made their views very clear in what they wrote publicly. James Hutton said this, the past history of our globe must be explained. Now he's going to tell us a rule, a law, for explaining the past history of our earth. And he says, it must be explained by what can be seen to be happening now. No powers are to be employed that are not natural to the globe. No action to be, accept, to be admitted except those of which we know is the principle. So what is he ruled out by that law of geological reasoning? He's ruled out creation. Creation wasn't happening when he wrote that sentence. And creation wasn't natural. It was supernatural. God calling things into existence by his power. What else has he ruled out? He's ruled out Noah's flood. Noah's flood wasn't happening when he wrote that sentence, and Noah's flood wasn't a natural event. Well, it was natural in the sense that uh, water flowed downhill in Noah's flood, just like water flows downhill today, and moving water eroded and carried sediments and deposited them someplace else, just like moving water does today. But the flood was not simply a natural event. It wasn't a fluke of nature. It was a divine judgment. It was God interrupting the normal course of nature. So he's ruled out creation in the flood before he ever looked at the evidence. In another place he said, But surely general deluges, that's an old way of saying global flood, form no part of the theory of the earth. Why, Mr. Hutton? Why can't we have a global flood in our past history? He tells us. For or because the purpose of this earth 
is evidently to maintain vegetable and animal life and not to destroy them. Now you see the reasoning? He said, hey, look at this world. It's obviously designed to support plant and animal life. So we can't allow a global flood in our past because that would destroy all the plant and animal life. What's he doing? He's reasoning that the present is the key to the past. Fundamental error. The present is not the key to the past. The 100% infallible eyewitness testimony of the Creator is the key to the past and the present. Biblical revelation is the key to the past and the present. James Hutton. So, we look at those different views of earth history. The catastrophes and uniformitarians did have a different view, but they were reasoning the same way. They were saying the present is the key to the past. The uniformitarians were saying the slow, gradual processes are the key to the past. The catastrophists were saying that all the catastrophic events are the key to the past. But they both rejected biblical revelation. The scriptural geologists were arguing that the present, that the biblical revelation is the key to the past and the present. Charles Lyell said this, I've always been strongly impressed with the weight of an observation of an excellent writer and a skillful geologist who said that for the sake of revelation, he's referring to the Bible, as well as of science, of truth in every form, the physical part of geological inquiry ought to be conducted as if the scriptures were not in existence. He said, we need to go out and look at the rocks as if the Bible doesn't exist. Well, I wouldn't have any problem with that if the Bible didn't talk about any geologically significant global events. But it talks about two. The third day of creation when God caused dry land to appear. Evidently was a huge erosion and sedimentation event. As part of the crust of the earth came up above sea level, the water drains off, it's going to erode and carry sediments. But there wouldn't be any plants or animal fossils in those sediments because God hadn't created plants and animals or people yet. The second key event was Noah's flood, which was designed to destroy all the animals, birds, and people not in the ark, and by implication would have ripped up all the vegetation on the land and buried lots of creatures in sediments. So when he says we need to do geology as if the scriptures are not in existence, that is a very anti-biblical perspective. In another place, he wrote in a private letter that... Uh, he wanted to free the science of geology from Moses. Now, isn't that a strange statement? What has he got against Moses? He wants to silence God's eyewitness testimony. So these men were not unbiased, objective pursuers of truth. And what these men introduced into geology were three assumptions that took control of geology in the 1830s and then through Darwin and others spread to all the other sciences in a modified form. The first assumption that took control of geology was that nature is all that exists. Now, not every scientist believed that, but most scientists began to do their science as if nature was all that exists. Modern science was actually born in the womb of the Christian worldview. The early scientists, Galileo and Kepler and Newton and, and many of the founders of the modern sciences, Kepler and, and others, Faraday, uh, they were Bible-believing people, at least significantly. But now we have an atheistic worldview taking hold. The second assumption that took control of geology is that everything can and indeed must be explained by three things. Time and chance and the laws of nature working on matter. If you have those three things, time, enough of it, millions and billions of years, chance and the laws of nature, 
you can explain the rock layers and fossils. Darwin took the same idea and said, if you have enough time, chance, and the laws of nature, you can explain the origin of living things. The Big Bang people came along in the 20th century, the same reasoning. If you've got enough time, chance, and the laws of nature, you can explain the origin of the heavenly bodies. And the third assumption that took control of geology is that the processes of geological change have always been operating in the past at the same rate and frequency and power as we observe today. Just slow, gradual processes. And the same was applied to biology and uh, astronomy and all the other sciences. So, in the early 19th century, you had those three competing views of Earth history. The scriptural geologist defending the biblical view of history, the, uh, the catastrophists, and the uniformitarians advocating uh, different views, but still millions of years. And by about 1840, uh, those first two views passed off the scene. Uniformitarianism became the ruling dogma or doctrine of geology. And 1840 is also about the time that the first degrees in geology began to be offered by universities. It's also the time when the first geologists began to make a living being a geologist, getting paid to study the rocks. And so every student who went to the university from 1840 on was trained to think like a uniformitarian. Slow, gradual processes will explain everything you see in the rocks. Charles, Lyle, or Charles Darwin took Charles Lyell's principles of geology on his five-year voyage around the world. And he said this in 1844, I always feel as if my books came half out of Lyell's brains and that I never acknowledge this sufficiently, nor do I know how I can without saying so in so many words. For I've always thought that the great merit of the principles of geology was that it altered the whole tone of one's mind and therefore that when seeing a thing never seen by Lyle, one yet saw it partially through his eyes. That was 15 years before Charles Darwin wrote his famous book, Origin of Species. There are a lot of Christians today that are concerned about the influence of evolution and they're opposed to biological evolution. And they, they think and they talk as if Darwin is the real problem. But Darwin wasn't the problem because he just built his ideas on the thinking of Charles Lyell. The problem started with the rejection of the biblical flood and the biblical chronology. If Darwin hadn't had millions of years to work with, his theory would have been dead in the womb. So what we need to understand is that everybody that goes out and looks at the world has a pair of glasses. Not a physical pair of glasses, but a set of assumptions that they use to interpret what they see. And most of the world, for the last 200 years, most scientists have been wearing what we call evolutionized millions of years glasses. They interpret everything they see in light of those assumptions. But Christians should be wearing biblical glasses. We should have our thinking informed, not by the elementary principles of the world, but by the eyewitness testimony of the Creator. So let me illustrate this way. Back in the early 19th century, you had these old earth geologists, and they had these naturalistic assumptions that they were using to interpret the rock record. Time and chance and the laws of nature will do it all. Biblical Christians had biblical assumptions. They believed the biblical account of creation and the flood and, and the age of the creation and many other things. But here's what happened. In the early 19th century, the geologists said, listen, if you want to be involved in helping us reconstruct the history of the rock layers of the earth, you need to lay down your Bible. You need to do geology as if the scriptures are not in existence. You need to come over to this neutral territory. And many Christians laid down their Bible. 
and uh, they got over into what they thought was neutral territory. However, the old earth geologists, they never laid down their assumptions, and they never got in that neutral territory because there really is no neutral territory. And once the Christians were in what they thought was neutral territory, what they thought was good science, the battle was over because there is no neutral territory. Everybody has a worldview. Everybody either believes in God or doesn't believe in God, believes that God is active in the world or isn't active. Everybody has a worldview. Don't let the atheists deceive you into thinking that they're not religious, that they don't have a worldview. The atheist is just as fundamentalist as I am. He believes God doesn't exist. I believe God does. He believes there's no moral absolutes. I believe there are. He believes there's no life after death. I believe there is. We both have beliefs. Atheism is a religion, and it is the religion that controls science and controls public education in this country. So, origin science and operation science. Operation science isn't affected very much by a person's worldview because it's controlled by the repeatable experiments, the nature of that kind of science. But origin science is very influenced by worldview. Because what a person believes about this book will affect their interpretation of the evidence. Well, what happened? So what we need to understand is everybody has the same rocks and fossils. Back in the 19th century, today in the 21st century. But they have different assumptions. If you start with naturalistic assumptions, you come up with the idea that it took millions of years to form rock layers and, and fossils. You start with biblical assumptions, and there's all kinds of evidence for a young earth and a global flood. But people don't see it because their assumptions are wrong. The battle is at the level of the assumptions, the worldview. Well, what happened? Well, by about 1850, as far as I can tell from my research, virtually the whole church had accepted the millions of years. The scriptural geologists were dying off. They had no real mechanism for replacing themselves. And uh, the commentaries had all compromised with the, with the millions of years. And uh, so I want to show you what happened now leading up to the present and the catastrophic consequences of this compromise. And I'm going to mention some people, very famous people, who were great Christians, who helped the church in a lot of ways, but who did not understand the nature of this battle. And so I want to, you to recall your uh, attention to this verse. Timothy, guard what was entrusted to you, avoiding worldly and empty chatter and opposing arguments of what is falsely called knowledge, which some have professed and thus gone astray from the faith. I'm going to show you men who did not personally go astray, but their compromise, their embracing of science falsely so-called, knowledge falsely so-called, has led many others to go astray. One of those was Charles Haddon Spurgeon, great Baptist preacher. And in 1855, at the age of 21, young pastor, he said in a sermon, can any man tell me when the beginning was? Years ago, we thought the beginning of this world was when Adam came upon it. Yes, that is what the church believed for the first 1,800 years, that Adam was made on the sixth day of history. That's what the Orthodox believing Jews believed for another 1,400 years before that. But, he says in 1855, we have discovered that thousands of years before that, God was preparing chaotic matter to make it a fit abode for man, putting races of creatures upon it who might die and leave behind the marks of his handiwork and marvelous skill before he tried his hand on man. In all of his published sermons and writings, Spurgeon said almost nothing about this issue. There's just a few scattered statements. No sustained discussion of the biblical text, and he evidently held to the gap theory. In another place, about 20 years later, he made a similar statement, but he talked about millions of years, and he mentioned geology. He obviously was influenced by 
the geological thinking, and he didn't understand where the idea of millions of years came from. Then there was uh, C.I. Schofield, great Bible scholar, produced his Schofield Reference Bible in 1909. Millions of copies of this Bible went out all over the English-speaking world. It was translated into other languages. And in the marginal note of Genesis 1-3, he had the gap theory with this statement. The first creative act refers to the dateless past and gives scope for all the geological ages. And that statement was in the Schofield Reference Bible until the 1967 edition. When the editors changed it slightly, it still leaves the door open for millions of years. He didn't understand where the idea came from. And millions and millions of Christians forgot a very important point, and that is, it's the biblical text that's inspired, not Schofield's notes. He was a smart Bible student, but he wasn't inspired, and he was wrong on this point. Then there's the sad story at Princeton Seminary, at Princeton University. It's been duplicated at many other schools. Charles Hodge was the lead theologian in the mid to late 19th century. He was old earth but anti-evolution. He wrote a book, What is Darwinism, and said it's atheism. But he says the Bible doesn't tell us how old the earth is. Initially, he favored the gap theory. By about 1860, he switched over to the day-age view. He died, and his son, A.A. A. Hodge, became the lead theologian. He also accepted the millions of years, but he toyed with the idea that maybe, just maybe, God used evolution. He died, and B.B. Warfield became the lead theologian. He was an ardent evolutionist until his conversion to Christ at about 18. He wrote a lot on the subject. That's almost all of it's been published in one book. He never carefully dealt with the biblical text, but he accepted the millions of years and was even warmer to the possibility of evolution as long as God was guiding it. Well, he died in 1921. Princeton Seminary went downhill into liberal theology very rapidly after that. And there are a number of reasons for that, but I believe this is one of the major reasons. Then there is Charles Templeton. He was a great evangelist, a contemporary of Billy Graham. He preached to thousands in crusades here in the United States and Great Britain. Thousands came to Christ through his preaching. But he had questions about evolution. He didn't know what to do with it. And so he went to seminary to get answers. He went to Princeton Seminary in the late 1940s. By that time, it had become thoroughly liberal. He didn't get any answers. He got professors teaching him that Genesis 1 to 11 is mythology. He left seminary. He preached for a few more years, left the ministry, went into journalism, died in 2001 as an atheist. And the last book he wrote was entitled, Farewell to God, My Reasons for Rejecting the Christian Faith. And he said this at the end of that book. I believe that there's no supreme being with human attributes, no God in the biblical sense, but that life is the result of timeless evolutionary forces having reached its present transient state over millions of years. Ideas have consequences. Charles Hodge was old earth but anti-evolution. His son was old earth and maybe evolution, as long as God is guiding it. B.B. Warfield was even warmer to evolution, as long as God is guiding it. And after they died, and I believe they went to heaven, Charles Templeton went to their seminary and became an apostate. Ideas have consequences, and sometimes it takes decades to see the fruit of wrong ideas. I wish those men had lived to read what this man said. Derek Ager was one of the greatest geologists of the 20th century, a uh, longtime professor at uh, University of, one, uh, University of uh, Swansea in Wales. He was uh, one time president of the British Geological Association. He personally traveled over 50 countries of the world studying geological formations. He wrote four books on geology and 200 technical journal articles. Very, very well known. 
The last book he wrote was published just after he died. In bold font in the preface, he warned people like me, uh, creationists, from using anything in his books to support our view. But he's dead now, so I do it all the time. Because he had something very important to say. He's writing in a book called The Nature of the Stratigraphic Record. He's writing to his fellow evolutionists. And as far as I can tell from his writings, he probably died as an atheist. But he's got a short section in the book where he's looking at the history of geology. And he's looking back at the early 19th century. And he says this. My excuse for this lengthy and amateur digression into history is that I've been trying to show how I think geology got into the hands of the theoreticians. In his mind, those were the uniformitarians of the early 19th century, Lyle and Hutton, who were conditioned by the social and political history of their day more than by observation in the field. He said, those uniformitarians were more controlled by social and political ideas in their heads than by what they were observing in the rocks. He goes on. In other words, we have allowed ourselves to be brainwashed into avoiding any interpretation of the past that involves extreme and what might be termed catastrophic processes. Brainwashed, that's his word, not mine. What's he saying? He's saying, look, when we went to, univer when we went to high school, we took our first geology class, and our teachers taught us Slow, gradual processes will explain everything you see in the rocks. We went off to the university and got a degree in geology. We were trained to think like uniformitarians. That training, that brainwashing continued in our PhD program. And then he graduated and he went out and looked at rocks. And as he traveled to those different countries, he saw more and more evidence of catastrophe. The last book he wrote was entitled The New Catastrophism. It was published just after he died, and it's full of examples. I'm going to show you one example, if I remember what I put in the slides. <laughs> but let me illustrate brainwashing for you. And uh, I have a little pop quiz for you tonight. It's just a one-question exam. It's a multiple-choice question. So here you have two curved yellow lines. And the question is, what was this picture originally? What's missing? Was it A? Was it B? Was it C? Or was it D? Anybody want to vote? A? B? C? Yes. D? The rest of you are chicken. You don't want to answer the question. Well, we'll grade the exam right now, and the correct answer is... Nothing was missing. It was drawn that way. Well, why did you think something was missing? Well, because I asked you what's missing. And you thought, well, he wouldn't ask what's missing if something's not missing. So I've got to figure out what's missing and put it into the picture. I controlled the way you thought about those two curved yellow lines just by putting a question into your head. Dr. Ager said, we were brainwashed so we couldn't see evidence of catastrophe. Well, he did see evidence of catastrophe in the rocks before he died, but he never saw the evidence of one single global catastrophe because, I believe, he had already rejected the Bible for some other reason, his sin. But this is one of the examples in his last book published after he died. The Sutton Stone is a conglomerate near his home, so he studied this extensively. And uh, he, he said this. This has usually been interpreted... Let me get this. This has usually been interpreted as the basal conglomerate of a diachronous transgressive sea. It has been suggested with very little fossil evidence that this conglomerate spans three to five ammonite zones. Those are sh shell creatures in the ocean and therefore up to five million years in time. Five million years to deposit this layer. But as he studied it, and as he had become open to catastrophe, he concluded, I think that it was deposited in a matter of hours or minutes. Wow, that's a big difference in interpretation. What changed? 
The rocks didn't change. His interpretation changed because he had become open to catastrophe as an explanation for what he was seeing. So, it all depends on what our assumptions are as to what we see and how we interpret what we see. The battle is at the level of the assumptions. Davis Young is one of the most influential uh, geologists today because he is Professor Emeritus of Geology at Calvin College, a Christian college in Michigan. He is the son of the great uh, Old Testament scholar of the 20th century, E.J. Young, who taught at Westminster Seminary. And he, more than anyone else, has influenced modern evangelical theologians to accept millions of years. His writings are often referred to in, the, in their theological writings. And uh, he said this, The Christian who believes that the idea of an ancient earth, he means millions of years, is unbiblical, would do better to deny the validity of any kind of historical geology and insist that the rocks must be the product of pure miracle. That God just miraculously created the Grand Canyon, for example rather than try to explain them in terms of the Noahic flood. An examination of the earth, apart from ideological presuppositions, is bound to lead to the conclusion that it is ancient. Well, I hope that you see what I am completely persuaded of. That statement could not be farther from the truth. There is no such thing as an examination of the earth apart from ideological presuppositions. Davis Young went off, well, his father never took a clear stand for the literal truth of Genesis. He did argue that Genesis 1 was history, but he waffled on the days, how long the days were. And his son went off to university and majored in geology and was taught to think like a uniformitarian. And then he has taught the church that that is doing geology apart from ideological presuppositions. One of the Old Testament scholars that he has heavily influenced is C. John Collins. He is professor of Old Testament at Covenant Seminary in St. Louis. He is the editor of the notes in the Old Testament part of the ESV Study Bible. Very influential scholar. In his book, Science and Faith, Friends or Foes, he advocates uh, what he calls the analogical day view, which is very similar to the day-age view. He accepts the millions of years. He says this. Whoops. Oh, my. I've just lost it. Go, down to the, go up to the top there, the play button, way up at the top. Uh, okay. Okay. This clicker must be getting tired. He says, I conclude then that I have no reason to disbelieve the standard theories of the geologists, including their estimate for the age of the earth. They may be wrong for all I know, but if they are wrong, it is not because they have improperly smuggled philosophical assumptions into their work. No, that is exactly what they have done. And I have had some spirited, I think God-honoring, but spirited conversations with Dr. Collins, uh, trying to get him to rethink that, uh, but he's not budging. Then there was Wayne Grudem, my favorite professor in seminary at Trinity Evangelical Divinity School. He's now at Phoenix Seminary, wonderful Bible scholar. In his systematic theology text, uh, which has been translated into 12 major languages, and they're working on eight more languages. Arguably the most influential evangelical theologian today. He says in that book, Although our conclusions are tentative at this point in our understanding, Scripture seems to be more easily understood to suggest, but not to require, a young earth view. While the observable facts of creation seem increasingly to favor an old earth view. No, Dr. Grudem, it is not the observable facts. 
It is the anti-biblical philosophical assumptions that have been used to interpret some of the facts. Ever since I was a student of his in the late 1970s and early 80s, uh, uh, late 80s, excuse me, and early 90s, I've been trying to get him to rethink that, and uh, he's not budging. Well, those two gentlemen in 2016 wrote a hearty endorsement of this book. Grand Canyon Monument to an Ancient Earth. Can Noah's Flood Explain the Grand Canyon? And the authors answer emphatically, no. The book was written by 11 authors, eight professing Christians, three non-Christians. Right away, a yellow flag, a red flag goes up in my mind. Because 2 Corinthians chapter 6 says, Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. So why are eight Christian authors writing a book with three non-Christian authors to attack the biblical account of the flood and criticize the writings of young earth creationist geologists? They endorse that book. But what they don't seem to know is that those authors were all evolutionists. The Christians were theistic evolutionists. The non-Christians were probably atheistic evolutionists. And they say that they're promoting, they want the church to believe in evolution. So they've endorsed a book that advocates for evolution, although in a kind of sneaky way. Well, that was 2016. In 2017, this book came out, Theistic Evolution. It's not in favor of theistic evolution, that God used evolution to create. It's against it. And the subtitle is, A Scientific, Philosophical, and Theological Critique. 25 authors, 1,100 pages long. Most of you probably won't bother to read that one. I haven't finished it, but I, the, the chapters I've read are very helpful. And I agree with them. But here's the problem. That's written against theistic evolution. Jack, Grudem, uh, Jack, Jack Collins and Wayne Grudem both contributed chapters to that book. But just the year before, they wrote an endorsement of a book written by theistic evolutionists. They are talking out of both sides of their mouth. These books, by four different evangelical publishers, are all pub promoting theistic evolution in the church. The two middle ones deny that there ever was an Adam and Eve. So the Bible is under assault in the church. Now I'm going to show you some pictures of people. And I want to just say uh, ahead of time, I'm not saying they're heretics. I'm not saying they're horrible people. I'm not saying they went to hell. I'm not saying they beat their wives. I'm not saying any of that. I'm not saying they didn't do any good for the church. But every one of these people I'm going to show you either openly promoted the acceptance of millions of years or indirectly did by saying it doesn't matter Every one of those men, R.A. Torrey, first president of Moody Bible Institute. We talked about Spurgeon, Hodge, Warfield, and Schofield. James Montgomery Boyce, great Bible teacher in Philadelphia. J. Vernon McGree, back to the Bible. John Stott, very famous pastor in England. Francis Schaeffer. They didn't all argue for millions of years, but they all indirectly or directly said the age of the earth doesn't matter. These are leading apologists today in the church, and all of them reject the young earth view. I've read many of their writings. They show no evidence of having read carefully young earth creationist literature. These two universities are the two leading universities producing apologists for the church today. Defenders of the faith. They don't accept young earth creation. They're teaching students that the age of the earth doesn't matter. 
these scholars are doing the same. They don't all explicitly teach millions of years, but they all directly or indirectly imply that the age of the earth isn't important. Same with these people. These are great men. They, they've written a lot of things that are really helpful to the church. But they're undermining the church's faith in Genesis. See, for 200 years, the scientific community has been saying, uh, these rock layers are millions of years old. The Bible's not true. You have to believe us because we're scientists. And most theologians for 200 years, most pastors have said, well, we'll just have to fit the millions of years into the Bible. So that's what they've tried to do. But all of those views, uh, all of those views fail for a lot of reasons. One is, the real, there really is solid scientific evidence to support Noah's flood and a young earth. But there's some serious theological reasons and biblical reasons that most of these men that I just showed you have never dealt with. I've read a lot of their writings. They don't realize that evolution is not just biology. It's also geology. It's also human origins. And it's cosmology. And even though most of those men would have, uh, and, and it's all based on naturalism or atheism, and even though most of those men would reject human evolution and biological evolution, they all accept, either directly or indirectly, the Big Bang, billions of years, and they say the age of the earth doesn't matter. So they're still accepting a naturalistic view of origins. And they've come up with all these different views. Here's another reason. Not only is, is their position wrong because they are accepting a naturalistic worldview, at least partially, but they have also have a, a, an idea that is common with all of them. They all interpret Genesis differently, but they all accept the millions of years of death and bloodshed and violence and extinction in the animal world before Adam. And... We have to reject that if we're going to believe what the Bible says about death, about the curse, about the very good creation at the beginning. Can't accept the millions of years of death before the fall. And I've read a lot of those men's writings and this whole issue of death before the fall isn't even on their radar. They haven't even thought about it. And I've talked to some of them personally and they've never thought about it until I talked to them about it. And related to that, if you believe that the, the geological record was formed before Adam, then it's millions of years, because that's the only place that idea comes from, is from the evolutionary scientific establishment. And you have to then believe that God looked at all of that and said, well, that's very good. But what kind of a God would call all of that death and disease and suffering very good? If it didn't happen before Adam, then it happened after Adam. If it happened after Adam, most of it, logical conclusion is, most of it was caused by Noah's flood. So if we accept the millions of years, we have to reject Noah's flood. And all those men that I just cited, almost all of them reject the flood as being global. Some of them do believe that it was global, and they believe in millions of years, but they haven't thought through the issue that you really can't believe both of those things because you can't believe in a flood that leaves no evidence. And the geologists who say the earth is millions of years old say there is no evidence for a global flood. So if we believe what God says, then we must reject the millions of years. And so the flood is usually forgotten and ignored by Christian leaders who are telling the church the age of the earth doesn't matter. Another fact that old earth proponents have overlooked is the fourth commandment. God told the children of Israel, you work six days and rest on the seventh, and he gave the reason for the command. He didn't give a reason for all the Ten Commandments, but he did give one for this one. And he said, for in six days the Lord made what? The heavens, the earth, the sea, and all that is in them. So he didn't make anything before the six days. 
He made everything in six days, and he used the same word for day that he used in the first part of the commandment when he told the children of Israel to work six days and rest on the seventh. So, I say this verse is a brick wall against putting millions of years anywhere in Genesis 1. Not into the days, not between the days, and not before the six days of creation. Because the first day starts at Genesis 1, verse 1, when God created the earth. Here's another reason why this matters. We have, our nation right now is experiencing civil war. Nobody's shooting at each other with guns yet. Well, no, I guess that is happening a little bit, but, <laughs> but we're shooting at each other with words. And it's a, comp, it, it's a conflict of two worldviews. The naturalistic worldview versus the biblical worldview. Our nation is in civil war. Of worldviews and if you start with a naturalistic worldview it's going to produce moral relativism because naturalism says there is no God and this book is not the Word of God and so the, who is there to tell me what is right and what is wrong nobody I can decide myself what is right and wrong what's good for you is good for you what's good for me is good for me but in the Bible the biblical worldview, this is the absolute authority for determining right and wrong. In the naturalistic worldview, what's marriage? It's whatever you want to define it to be. It can be a man and a, a woman. It can be a man and a man, a woman and a woman, three men and one woman, one man and three women, three women. I haven't heard it yet, but I am sure we're going to hear it. Somebody is going to use the same arguments to say, why can't it be a man and his dog, or a woman and her cat? It can just be whatever I want to define it, we're told. But the Bible says that God created gender, He created marriage, and marriage is one man and one woman for life. Why has our culture totally rejected this in terms of our laws? because we have rejected the authority of the Word of God. And what is the number one reason that we have rejected the authority of the Word of God? The teaching of cosmological, geological, biological, and anthropological evolution, which says this book is based on mythology. Under the naturalistic worldview, life is not sacred. So we can murder the babies in the womb. We can murder them right up until they come out of the womb. We can even murder them right after they come out of the womb, which is what the governor of Virginia has indirectly advocated. And we can, we can light up the, uh, the Empire State Building or whatever it was that they put in pink and uh, celebrate the slaughter of babies. And we can assist people to commit suicide or even... Maybe make that decision for them and euthanize them. Because life is not sacred. When we die, we'll be dead. We won't know that we ever lived. But under the biblical worldview, there's sanctity of life from conception to the grave. Two different worldviews. The foundations have been destroyed. Through the teaching of evolution in millions of years, the authority of the Bible has been destroyed in our culture. That's why our country is at civil war. And this naturalistic worldview isn't just saying that Darwin's theory is right. It's also saying that the world is billions of years old and the universe is billions of years old. And this, this whole universe is the result of a big bang that happened by chance. But if you try to build on a naturalistic worldview, you, there are, there's no moral values. They're gone. And we've lost them in this country just about. And there's lies going on in our country. There are people saying things in political office that are exactly the opposite of the truth. And evil is being called good, and good is being called evil. And Isaiah warned in Isaiah 5 verse 20, Woe to you who call evil good and good evil. 
Well, let me uh, wrap this up with a series of pictures. Back in the 18th century, Jesus, uh, the, the uh, Christian said, come to Jesus, come to the cross and be saved. And the enemies of the gospel launched an attack against that gospel. It was the idea of millions of years. It wasn't aimed at the cross. It was aimed at the foundation of the cross, the book of Genesis. And it caused damage. And the enemies of the gospel knew that it was a direct hit. I, I could give you quotes from people. They knew what it was doing. But most of the church said it didn't hit the cross. Don't worry about that. It doesn't matter when God created, how God created, how long he took to create. It doesn't matter whether Noah's flood was global or not or catastrophic or not. Don't worry about that. The Bible's not about geology. It's about theology and salvation. If they had aimed at the cross, alarm bells would have gone off and Christian leaders would have risen up in defense. But the enemies were smart. They didn't aim at the cross. They aimed at the foundation of the cross. And most of the church said it's just a side issue. It doesn't matter. But what is... What does Psalm 11.3 say? If the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? And so, from the early 19th century bombardment of the biblical flood and the chronology, then came Darwin hammering away on the creation account, and then in the 20th century, the Big Bang Theory, just totally decimating with its billions of years. And the dating methods were developed in the early 20th century. By the way, radiometric dating is not what led people to believe in millions of years. By the end of the 19th century, the geological community was already locked into 300 million years. All that radiometric dating did was to expand that to about 4.6 billion years by about 1940. And the enemies of the gospel see this as a direct hit, but most of the church said it didn't hit the cross. But what happened in the Garden of Eden when the serpent came to Eve and he said, has God said? He asked a question. He put a doubt in her mind. He put confusion into her mind about what God said. And once he got her doubting or confused about God's word, then he went for the kill and he said, you won't die Go ahead and eat that fruit. God's lying to you. He's trying to keep something good from you. You can go ahead and become your own God. And that works so well on Adam and Eve that uh, Satan has been using that strategy ever since. And what I have learned and what I have observed is that Satan is not picky. He will actually use, he delights in using Christians to get other Christians to doubt and deny God's word. We're in a battle, folks. And Paul warned that Satan would use the same strategy on you and me that he used on Eve. Get people to doubt and deny God's word. And so we've seen growing unbelief. Western Europe is a, is a missionary graveyard. I've been there many times. I lived in Europe for almost 20 years. A recent report indicated that 130 million atheists in Europe it is, it is the most secular part of the world. At the end of the Second World War, in Great Britain, 50% of the people went to church every Sunday. Today, it's down to about 5%. And most of the churches aren't worth attending because they're theologically liberal. There are more Muslim mosques being built in England than there are churches each year. And America is rapidly going down the same path. They now tell us we have 25% of our population are nons, non identify they don't identify with any religion they're either professing atheists or practical atheists the church's compromise with millions of years has not caused people to be more open to the gospel the history of the bible is foundational to the theology and the morality destroy the history and in the minds of millions of people you destroy the theology and the morality and we just have more of these ideas coming up in the church to try to harmonize 
And so that's why God's raised up Answers in Genesis and the Creation Museum and the Ark Encounter and other creation ministries, the Institute for Creation Research, the Creation Research Society, other groups and even in other countries to help rebuild the foundations. And, uh, and then we go out and do seminars and shoot down those ideas and train the church how to shoot them down with the resources so that then the church can say, come to Jesus, come to the cross and be saved and there will be integrity, there will be uh, power in the message because we'll say the gospel in this book is true because the history in this book is true right from the very first verse. And we won't see uh, 60 to 80% of young people growing up in the church today who are walking away from the church never to return. So we're in a war. And... Uh, it's a war of ideas. And when we sent our troops to Afghanistan, we didn't send them with a sack lunch and a pat on the back and say, hope it goes well for you. They went with weapons. And our weapons are the truth, the truth of God's word and the truth of his creation, which screams Noah's flood and a young earth and a supernatural creation. 